What's up guys, my name is Connor and welcome to the Songwriter Sanctuary. Today we're going to be talking about the Beatles. Why are they so weird with their wings and the way they scuttle around? Let me try that again. The Beatles are a British rock band that really needs no introduction. Love them or hate them, they basically single-handedly revolutionized rock and pop music. So today we're going to look at three of their most interesting and iconic chord moves and figure out what makes them tick. Why do they work? Real quickly, I just want to throw out a caveat that the material in this video is kind of at an intermediate music theory level. So if anything in this video is confusing or you feel like you don't quite follow it, I would recommend starting with this video here and then come back to this one. If you do like this video and you get something out of it, then please subscribe to this channel and like this video. There are little things that help the channel out tremendously. And with all that being said, Let's get into it. All right, so the first chord progression we're gonna be talking about is from Penny Lane. We're gonna be talking about the second half of the verse and how it transitions into the chorus. The little children loving him behind his back. And this is kind of a doozy, so get ready. So the song's in the key of B and it starts with this cute little walk down. We have a one chord, then one over seven, then one over six, and then one over five. Basically just walks right down the major scale. Following that, it goes to the minor one chord with the melody note and the vocal line serving as the minor seven. So we actually have a one minor seven chord. This temporarily makes us feel like we're moving to the key of D instead of B, where the one minor chord acts as a six chord. Usually this is a tricky thing to do smoothly, but the Beatles pull it off here masterfully. For the sake of explanation though, even though it's sort of temporarily functioning as a six chord, we're just gonna call it the one minor. What happens next is really cool. We maintain the minor chord, but we put it over a six, which is B minor over G sharp or a G sharp half diminished chord. From there, the bass drops from G sharp down to G, but still under a B minor chord. The piano part has not changed since we switched from the major chord to the minor chord. So, so far for the piano, all that we have had is a B major triad into a B minor triad, but we're still not done. Our root drops from the six down to the five, and we have a five sus chord into a five dominant chord. The five sus, or F sharp sus, looks like F sharp, B, C sharp. If you compare that to the notes from the B minor chord that we're already on, all we are doing is moving the D in that B minor chord down to a C sharp. And then with F sharp in the bass, it becomes our five sus chord. So minimal movement, but a complete chord change. Then for the dominant chord, your B resolves down to A sharp. We had an E in there for the minor seven. So instead of the dominant chord acting as a dominant and taking us to the one as it normally would, we go down to a four major chord and that chord acts as the dominant. That takes us to the flat seven or A major at the beginning of the chorus. But little did we know that that four major chord was actually gonna be used to pivot the key. Now, instead of that A chord being the flat seven chord, it now functions as a one in the key of A. There's so much going on here in these few seconds. So what's actually important here? As a songwriter, what can we use? So for me, the thing that really resonates here is turning the major one into the minor one and then having that bass note walk down. Stepping down to the six, then the flat six, landing on the five chord. And you can do what the Beatles did and go to the four chord or some other chord, or you can just use that as a straight up dominant and go back to the one. Here's another way that you might use that sequence of chords. All right, the second progression we're gonna look at is the chorus of In My Life. All these places have their moments. Now this is gonna look pretty simple, especially when compared with Penny Lane, but I had to talk about this one because it holds a special place in my heart. In my third grade music class, we sang this song at our spring sing, and this was the song that made me fall in love with rock music. I was obsessed, and when I found out my parents had a CD of the Beatles' greatest hits, I had the song looping on repeat while I fell asleep every night. And this chord progression that I'm about to show you is the reason why. It was so beautiful and like nothing I had heard up to that point in my life that it just haunted me, it followed me. So anyways, the progression is broken into two halves. The first half goes six, four, flat seven, one. And then the second half goes six, major two, minor four, one.
That's all the non-diatonic chords that add this wistfulness and this sense of longing and wonder into the progression. You have that flat seven in the first half, which is one of my all-time favorite chords. Every video where it comes up, I will rant and rave about how much I love that chord. But then the major two in the second half pushes you in a completely different direction. The two usually feels like a bit of a question mark, but making it a major two makes it feel like you're asking a question and being lifted at the same time. We transition from that into the minor four, which gives this very melancholy falling feeling as it sinks back into the one. So you start with the one and then you start to get a little hopeful as it elevates into that major two. You hit that minor four and your hopes are dashed and you land on the one and you don't know if you're happy or sad. You feel this sense of melancholic peace and it's a weird confluence of different emotions that's really hard to articulate. In my life, I love you more but eight-year-old me could not get enough. So the thing that we can focus on here is that major two and the minor four move. This can be used in a myriad of different ways. Here's another progression that includes that chord move. Now you'll notice a couple weird things about what I did there. I used an inversion of the major two where I had the sharp four in the bass. And the reason I did that is that sharp four just melts into the four as the root of our next chord. Then the minor four, you may have noticed that I turned it into a minor six chord. The D in that chord doesn't belong in a regular minor triad. It's the six in the key of F, and that gives it this extra sense of suspense and longing, as if we didn't already have enough. But I'm a sucker for those two chords in conjunction like that, and you're free to use that too. You can even steal the progression I just used if you'd like. All right, finally, we're gonna talk about the verse of Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. So this song is in the key of A, and this is the Beatles really embracing their psychedelic era. Picture yourself in a boat on a river. It's them making use of theory principles and chord moves that weren't really accepted in the mainstream up until this point. So the first few chords just seem like a basic, once again, walk down. We have our one chord and our root goes one, flat seven, six, sharp five. Looking at these as slash chords, there's nothing really that interesting here. However, when we break down what these chords actually are, things start to get weird. So when we go to the flat seven in the root, it creates this sense of wonder and mystery. What we have is a one dominant chord, but over the least stable scale degree in that chord, the flat seven. When we go down to the six, that's basically a six minor seven chord. By the way, that's an interesting thing to know if you didn't already, is that if you take a major chord and you put it over its relative minor, it becomes a minor seven chord with the root of the relative minor. So for example, if you take a C chord and you put it over A, you get an A minor seven chord. It's just kind of an interesting way to look at the theory. Anyways, that's not super exciting. What happens after that is where things really get odd. We have the one over the sharp five. And so I'll confess, I usually do all the research and analysis in these videos on my own. But for this one, I had to consult a friend of mine who's a theory whiz. We can look at this chord two different ways. We can look at this chord as a one chord, which is your A chord with a flat 13, which is F. Or we can look at this chord as a flat six major seven chord, which is F major seven with a sharp five. So you can see why this chord is a bit of an oddball. And listening to it by itself, it sounds incredibly dissonant. So as I was breaking this progression down, I couldn't figure out which one it acted as. Did it act as the one chord or did it act as the flat six chord? I was hearing it more as the flat six. And the reason why is if you continue this progression, it circles back around at the beginning, over five instead of one, but it's basically still just a major chord, follows the same pattern of chords, but then lands on a straight flat six major. So to me, it felt like this weird chord was kind of a substitute for the just straight up major triad that we encounter a few beats later. But I showed this to my friend, shout out Justin, and he was hearing it the complete opposite way. He was hearing it as the one chord despite the fact that the flat six was in the bass and we had a flat six later. So I'll leave it up to the listener. What do you guys think? All of that aside, I think the easiest way to think about it is just a slash chord. Just look at it as a one over flat six or sharp five. And then the rest of the progression is exactly what I just explained. Tangerine trees and marmalade skies. 
So what can we take away from this progression? Well, number one, putting a flat six chord at the end of a progression can be an interesting choice, so that's good to know. But to me, the thing that's more important is this shows that you can put the one chord over any chromatic scale degree and make it work if you're tactful about it. So I'm gonna demonstrate this. I'm gonna do a progression where I play the one chord over every descending scale degree all the way down to the sharp four. Then just for kicks, I'm gonna go to that flat six chord since we talked about it, and I'm gonna resolve it back to the one. That all looks like this. So hopefully you found something useful or interesting in this video. As I've already mentioned, the Beatles were my first rock and roll love, so this was an incredibly fun video to make. If you've made it this far, I appreciate you watching all the way through, and I really appreciate your support. Once again, if you found this valuable or interesting, I encourage you to subscribe to this channel and like this video. And that's all she wrote. I'll see you in the next one. Peace. Mm -hmm.